Thanks, Raquel. Uh, hello, and welcome to the 10th event in our faculty forum series hosted by the Music Therapy Faculty Forum Steering Committee. I'm Andrew Knight, an associate professor of music therapy at Colorado State University, and along with Vicki Vega, who is professor of music therapy at Loyola University in New Orleans, we co-chair the steering committee. We are a group of eight educators looking to host these forums to support music therapy educators and provide a space for important conversations around music therapy education. In addition to the two of us, I'd like to make sure that you know the rest of the committee, Susie Sorrell from Molloy College, Melanie Kwan from Washington Adventist, Jan Schreiben from the University of Indianapolis, Raquel Ravioli from Marietta College, Debbie Gombert from Eastern Michigan University, and Andy McGraw-Hunt from Rowan University. This is the second iteration of the steering committee, and we are in our second and final year of service as a group. The mandate of the steering committee is to look at a future organizational structure for shared faculty governance and to create these events to engage in the tasks of the steering committee. These tasks are to establish trust, build community, and create avenues for conversation, to be conscientious of not taking a side on issues, and to serve as a liaison between faculty and AMTA. We have been and will continue to be a group that encourages open and collegial conversation amongst all participants while maintaining independence from AMTA and any other formal music therapy body. Also, please consider nominating music therapy educators or yourself to serve on the next faculty steering committee. You can contact me or Vicki Vega with any questions or nominations. A reminder call for nominations will again be going out and nominations have been extended until June 1st. If you have topics to suggest to us for future events, email any of us individually, or you can find us uh, collectively at musictherapyfaculty at gmail.com. It's musictherapyfaculty, all one word, at gmail.com. And the email will be in the chat. Tonight, in this faculty forum event, we will investigate ways in which to leverage music technology in our music therapy education and clinical practices. Next, we will be provided with a student wellness program that is especially helpful in this time of transition post-pandemic. Now I'll pass it over to Melanie Kwan, who will introduce our first speakers this evening. Thank you, Andrew. So I had the opportunity to interview the authors of the newest music technology book for our session today. Due to the time difference, they are in the Netherlands. It was about six hours ahead. It was pre-recorded. So the strengths of the book are how it serves as a handbook with its clinical thinking resources for educators and how it, it introduces functional and adaptive ways of using technology. So let's go directly into the video recording, shall we? Today, I'm happy that the authors of Navigating Music Technology are here with us to share more about their newly published book. Thank you, Carola, Marika, and Arthur for taking the time to discuss with us about music technology and music therapy. So, everyone is in for a special treat. Our audience comprises music therapy, faculty, educators and adjuncts, along with clinical, internship supervisors and directors. Let's begin by briefly introducing our panelists, starting with Ms. Swerger. As a music therapist and music educator at Artes University of the Arts, Ms. Swerger is very passionate about educational development. She also loves to create and learn new things in sculpturing and ceramics. Welcome. 
Ms. Greathouse is always trying to find the possibilities for each client to play along and join the music by using music technology. She also loves to travel, meet other cultures, and be in nature to free the mind. Thank you for joining us. And also Dr. Yeska, a passionate and devoted researcher after finds long ocean sailing voyages for long walks with his border collie, Robin, through the Scottish countryside refreshing. Both allow for self-reflection and the incubation of new ideas. So thank you again for taking the time to join us. And I've prepared six questions to focus our time together. So the first one, tell us about your book. What was the inspiration behind it? Uh, um, I was studying my master's um, by the time and I wanted to dive into a subject not so familiar to me. So I ended up with uh, music technology because as many of us are, or maybe still are, um, I was kind of scared about uh, using technology in my clinical practice and I tried to avoid it <laughs> wherever possible. So then um, Marijke and I uh, discussed um, this uh, and we thought, so maybe this is something to, to dive deeper into and also in literature we found that many music therapists want to get involved with technology but also on the other hand are scared or they have all this ideas about I'm not capable of using it. So then we decided to dive into this and see if we can um, combine all these elements and, and bring it uh, to a, a kind of um, a book or a structure uh, in how to learn and to help others to learn um, using technology. So as being a um, uh, as knowing uh, nothing about technology myself, that was the starting um, for point. For me, the inspiration was that um, I think it's necessary as a music therapist to use both traditional and technology whenever needed. So everybody needs to uh, be into the music and can join the music. And I was very happy with the question of Carola. How can we do this in our team also and in our curriculum and how can we in, in integrate everything together so i think this was a wonderful journey and it needs to keep on going because it's never ending i'm not a music therapist you know, i have to confess <laughs> in this group uh, i'm a neuroscientist you know and i'm uh, also a musician and a musicologist and I'm trying to combine those things together into the profession that we call music therapy Wonderful. and the, the beauty of music technology is that we just have to look around us you know we just have to see how the world has evolved and how the world is evolving that technology has kind of seeped slowly but surely into the fabric of our everyday life you know and it would be a missed chance for music therapy as a profession as an educational body as a research body to miss the boat completely and not take the technology on board you know because the clients from the future will not be the clients that we have now so there's not people that are sitting in chairs maybe reading a book but it will be clients sitting in chairs reading on an ipad or maybe even worse on a sort of interactive room thing floating around you know with uh, new technological approaches so if we don't approach the technology part now we're going to be too late later and i think that is the uh, one of the biggest opportunities and limitations at the same time yeah, and i think this was really brought to light in covid 19 with the lockdowns everything was online it also shows the the um the difficulties in working online and uh, or working face to face, it's totally different. So um, as I see music technology is really the instrument where you can play music on, on the device. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities, but there are also limitations. And the limitation can be when the, uh, the music therapist doesn't know how it works, doesn't know exactly what kind of uh, chances, uh, motivational factors inside that device are recording to the goal setting also of the session. So there's, there are limitations, but it's us to get knowledge, acquire knowledge, uh, and just play with it, because if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, so lots of opportunities, but also limitations. But 
we can do something about the limitations. Yeah, it can be very intimidating to get started too. And then, you know, unless we get comfortable with it, we can't use it with others and we can't make it safe for others to engage with it too. So. And in the respect, uh, just, just to add to this, uh, being scared of using it, you know, you also have to see the uh, generational change because we, uh, coming from an older generation in inverted commas, you know, no offense to anybody, we are not as... Um, as easy going with technology like our kids for example you know they are kind of growing up with it so that's the point where where carol and marika thought well hang on we have to bring it back into the educational setting because we have to train the trainers right. of the music therapists of tomorrow because they need to know how to use it because i mean kids of, of two three years old are better on an ipad than anybody of us will ever be you know and that's a, it's an unbelievable quick change so we have to catch up with the generation that is coming after us. And I think and that's the beauty of the book and especially the beauty of the um, approach towards education and professionalization of music therapists at large. For me, this was the big question in the beginning to start with writing about this and thinking about this. So why am I so scared of using it? Because I don't know what the opportunities and the limitations are. And then diving into it, I found out that you can learn how to use uh, technology. Um, and But then you don't know anything, you know how to use it. <laughs> so the next step was learning how to use why and when and where. Mm. And that is the, the thing that also um, uh, comes with limitations. The limitations are not usually not in the technology itself. The limitations are in the user or in the context. And uh, thinking about this, um, we need to think along with our clients and our students and our faculty in how to develop new ways and new pathways of learning to apply technology and, and approaches approach this as another instrument in a range of instruments, like uh, Wendy McGee already mentioned um, earlier in her uh, book in 2014, for example. So it's learning to play a new instrument and like any other instrument, it has um, limitations, but also opportunities, but mostly they lie not in the instrument, but in the context, in, in the situation and how to apply it. And you mentioned within your book, the clinical reasoning model. So there's a reciprocal process where teacher and trainee both teach to learn and learn to teach. So I like the play of words there, the concepts there. Um, would you like to expand more, more on this piece? Okay, so um, the basic idea behind was that in this reciprocal process, um, first of all, you need to learn how to use the instrument, the technology. And this is something that is um, trained uh, in the students but also in faculty and uh, the clinicians so you learn how to use your instrument and then in the next step um, you contextualize it so in the educational situation you help the student who has not yet this clinical expertise which is there in the faculty um, so you help the students to um, to notice, to learn to notice in case studies, what steps is a clinician, a clinical music therapist, um, what steps do you have to take when you think about um, organizing your music therapy uh, session? And then at what point uh, the technology comes in? Is it a functional or an adaptive uh, way of using uh, technology? So is it helping you uh, provide the client to become a musician or does it have a training goal, for example? So thinking about this, um, that, that's something you do together with your students and then uh, uh, coached by a technology expert, in our case it was Marijke, and then I videotape this and I bring this video case into my learning community, my colleagues, and we discuss about educational uh, concept, uh, how we apply this, uh, what we see in, and how we can develop from there. So we are all learning in the same situation um, and then uh, so you have this um, uh, learn to notice but also um, building new conceptual frameworks to continue with this learning process. I think it's it's it should be 
the way a music therapist thinks about uh, what is the goal of this session and what do I need to uh, prepare, use or whatever to achieve that goal. Um, so for me, it's it's not really only about music technology. I think it's all, always, you should do this always traditionally or uh, with technology. But in this case, with technology, you also have so many sorts of uh, technologies and which one do you want to use because you have loop stations in several ways but which one do i use for this purpose you need to think about that and what are the opportunities of this device and can i move on then or do i have to shift and make it more difficult so this is the knowledge we need to know before we can make good considerations in the clinical reasoning model what to use and for what purpose and uh, elaborating on the both teach to learn and learn to teach i mean the beauty of that is that, that you are equal to your peers to start off with because the technology is still such a novelty item uh, that you need to learn from each other you know and what, what we said earlier with um that the students nowadays are much more literate in technological use than we are a typical process as such you know with, with a teaching to learn learning to teach aspect and so, so we are not really teachers in the old sense anymore and we're not students in the old sense anymore we are uh, well it sounds a bit bit weird but you're kind of travelers towards a a higher ground of knowledge you know and we just do it together and let's let's join in together and let's learn from each other in in, in the path you know and that's that's the only thing to really understand and apply knowledge yes i think just one more thing to to add to this is that um the learning happens in this um, common learning space, this safe space for teachers and students, where you reflect on the actions. Uh, so it's a reflection in action by doing it and, and, and learning together, and then afterwards reflect on action to make new models, learning models, and that's what faculty can take from this. And also the students will um, elaborate on this. So this reflective learning process is an ongoing process and, and a very exciting uh, journey. This one, um, just um, explaining how my uh, course looks like. Uh, my students' first years are working on different kind of technologies. They learn how to, how it can be used, how you just push the buttons, etc. So I always start with the iPad because if you understand the iPad, you know the the terminology behind technology. So I don't have to repeat that afterwards again. And then they can build up their knowledge. So uh, they are working with the iPad on several ways uh, in the live loops or in the tracks. And then they are learning it by case-based learning. So we are going to combine it and bring it to the therapy sessions. And um, then we are going to incorporate why am I using this? So the clinical reasoning model is coming there. And we do that with every separate technology. Um, we've got several kinds of technologies, so they are just learning and then I always let them uh, play in my playground, I always call it my playground, um, just experience, uh, try out, and I'm, I am rocking around coaching them and then asking questions. What should you do in a clinical session with this? For what population would you use this? And then they are starting to think like uh, music therapists and um, at the end of the year uh, i'm just giving them case cases okay and now clinical reasoning what do you use to achieve the goal and that's how we are working and that's what you also see in in the book um, learn to work with it then next step, learn to combine it, bring it to the clinical uh, setting. And students of us are working in clinical settings when they are just doing their internship using music technology also. Uh, some exercises for teachers and students to, um, to work together and learn together. For example, the mix and match uh, cards. So you have uh, several categories. Um, so one of the categories is the, the technology itself and the other category is um, the, the clinical goal 
or maybe the approach or uh, music therapy technique you use. So you just random take cards out of every category, mingle them and the student gets a case, a case study. Okay, and you have to apply these three elements. So thinking about um, opportunities and limitations of the technology, of the client, of the context, and to in order to bring this together, they need to use the clinical reasoning structure because otherwise you don't know why you want to apply something or why not. So this is very hands-on uh, learning and incorporated into the um, curricular structure. Yes, and I may I add something to that? Because it also gives a fun factor. You need to think out of the box sometimes because the combination of cards is totally not possible. But they learn to think and when it's not possible at the end they can make the conclusion okay this is for this and this reason not possible to achieve the goal that's okay too because sometimes it's just not possible and that's the fun part behind it too but always with um, learning circles in it well, I think uh, you need to bring in technology into the building. <laughs> so make sure that there is a lot of uh, stuff uh, for students to experiment with. Uh, we also started with a tech lab, uh, which is an open space where um, uh, all kinds of technologies are available and students can experiment on, on their own um, and figure out what are the opportunities of the technology. Um, so we don't have to make it a, a structured uh, situation always. So a free space, a safe space to experiment is also very important in this uh, particular situation. Um, yes, and what the other thing we do is uh, Marijke provided a, a lot of uh, really nice webinars on specific technologies, which are available for students and faculty. So you always can learn a lot from, from that. And what we see now is that the students themselves figure out in this tech lab and free space about new technologies and they make webinars. Every music therapist should have an iPad because it's the bridge. You can play this the same way as on traditional instruments on, on the iPad, but it's electronics, okay? But you can play the same way. You can press also. It's getting dynamic too. So that's that's... The development we have but for uh, the next step i would recommend absolutely the cosmo from felicia um it's in the book too of course and um when i started with the cosmo it was just um uh limited for me but then i just reached out to the developers and we made a connection and uh we uh, changed it to a very effective uh, instrument for uh, music therapists to work on functional training parts like attention, executive functions, memory, um, planning organization, but also adaptive like improvisation, but uh, on the music you like from Spotify or Apple Music or whatever, because it's not uh, so so modern to use iTunes anymore. You don't buy it. You just take your uh, account Jimmy. on Spotify mm -hmm. or streaming the devices so we connected that and also uh, you don't have always the time to uh, get all keys and skills and chords chord progressions done easily so we added uh, an automatic key detection so when you just want to work on playing around in the right key to get that success feeling of success um, you can just push that button put it on and the client will always have success but there are some issues behind it, safety, because at one time the blue uh, light bulb can be sounding like a C pitch. And then the next time it's a D. So when you have an artist, it can be very confusing. Just shut it off, install the right keys for you, the right pitches, and then you can work also again. So the Cosmo would be very recommended. And so you mentioned that Cosmo, you had to reach out to the developer. So is this patch or this accommodation available like um, for everybody now? Or do music therapists still have to reach out to the developer? No, we are working with the developer. We are working in the total program in the bachelor and in the master. Uh, I 
let students think about things. And when we find out an issue, I'm just connecting to the developer again. We are working together and then it's set. Questions from, from uh, clinical uh, music therapists about what shall I uh, uh, buy? I want to use technology. <laughs> just give me an advice. What mm -hmm. technology? And that's a hard question to answer because yes. you need the clinical reasoning behind it to decide what device you want to use. So it's not about the technology. It's not about the device. It's about the client and the context and what you want to um, offer for this client uh, and how technology can be useful in achieving that. So sometimes, depending on your uh, population, um, you use the iPad. Uh, sometimes you use a Cosmo, sometimes you use uh, just an Ami app or uh, a Soundbeam or a Magic Flute or things like that. But that's depending on uh, what is needed for, for your clients. And um, this is exactly why um, sometimes integration of technology in the clinical field is not successful because we focus too much on the technology itself and not on the context and how and why we should apply it or maybe not sometimes it's not useful to apply technology so this thinking about technology as one of the instruments um, it's the same question shall i buy a guitar or a piano and why Oh, maybe I should buy a guitar because I want to be flexible and move around. Yeah. Yes, thank you for bringing it back to McFarland. Um, Arthur? Yeah, this is get the competencies into the curricula mm. is maybe by starting to ask the question. What do I need? How do I need it? Do I need it? Because it could be possible that the, uh, a curriculum is already um, made and, and built around other key factors where a technological approach may be too much, you know, where, where it's just overkill in what you're trying to do. And then a, um, a masterclass would fit much better, for example, you know, so it's, it's really the, the kind of development and innovation aspect of education. So it's really asking the question, you know, if I need technology, why do I need technology in the curriculum and how can I facilitate the technology? Um, because uh, exactly what Carola says, you know, the, the, the fact that it fails is um, because people try to either force it into something mm -hmm. and then it's not going to work because it's, it's it's already a block or there is a um a, a serious um focus on the technology itself itself other than the question what does the client really need and what do i as an educator really need to teach my students do the students really need that or maybe the students already use technology in everyday practice uh, playing a background track from the from the phone that's already using technology so you know where do we have to step in to really pick up the the the, 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 bar, the ball and run with it yes it goes back to the thinking behind it and the clinical reasoning. particular situation, um, we um, interviewed uh, all faculty members and asked them um, how they think about technology, uh, whether they think they would apply it or not, how, how comfortable they feel uh, with using it, uh, what they would like to learn. Um, so we first started with addressing all the uh, personal questions on technology um, that's how this this um, book developed also is to come together so um, what we uh, started to do is um, ask uh, every um, faculty member to uh, use technology no matter what technology just one or two technologies every now and then in their um, in their classroom um, and see if they uh, can learn along with the students and, and get feedback from students and also feedback from uh, Marijke um, on um, how they used it. So, and that was a motivation for the faculty members too because um, they figured out that it was not that scary and mm -hmm. that it was actually fun because if you create a safe space for the students, you also create a safe space for you as a faculty member or a teacher. So you're in this together. And and actually it's this playground where you can meet and see what's going on. 
And most of our faculty were happy to dive into this, uh, even if it was scary or even if they didn't know anything about technology. So just start somewhere, create a safe space, bring in one or two technologies and go. <laughs> don't need technology experts you don't need to be a uh, an IT expert in order to use technology in music therapy but see what it can do for you because that's what technology is it's an extension of our human incapabilities and a extension towards something that we cannot do and uh, and and that's how we should use technology so it's not a scary thing it's something that empowers you to do things that you would have never imagined before and you have the control until unless well that for the next 50 years you still will have control after that i do not dare to do any predictions but even then i mean we're really if you look into the technological development it all sounds big and huge the metaverse this and that really don't be afraid of it it's like being afraid of a guitar or like like being afraid of cooking a a, a bowl of soup you know it's, it's exactly the same just use the tools that you have and expand on your knowledge in order to uh, empower yourself to be a, or become a better therapist I was just thinking about what I always see happening when I teach people how to use the buttons and just to play with the music and the amazement that it's in fact pretty simple to do, <laughs> but you need to do it. That's the amazing part and they are, we all become, uh, whenever we are adults or whatever, we all get a little bit childish where, oh can i do this or can i do that and then you're fooling exactly. around and play starting to play that's what it's all about it's the same amazement you can have when you push the a key of a piano for the first time and you hear that sound back it's the same only technology can have a bug and it can uh, just keep, uh, stop working just close the app down or whatever start it over press the buttons and go on. But it's just mm. about playing around with things. Just be a child, explore and do so. And it's, it's for faculty, it's for students, it's for music therapists in the field, it's for us all. Very nice, Marika. Marika, um, you brought us back to Carolyn Kenny, the field of play, even um, Dr. Clive Robbins, the inner child. So it's all within our field and technology again is just the new instrument. So we've come a full circle and how can our audience reach you if they would like to ask further questions or find out more about the book, how they can get their hands on the book? Uh, so if they address the questions to Artes Music Therapy, they, uh, they will uh, get in contact with us too. And okay, the book should be good. available on all um, normal sites. I will not do any advertisement now for any sites because I do not support the big selling sites. I'd rather go to your local <laughs> bookshop, say you want the book, and they will make sure that, you, that they, it will reach you worldwide. Uh, you can also go to the Artes Press site and you can order it right there and they're going to ship it worldwide as well. So uh, um, it is widely available. Just look up Navigating Music Technology and off you go. <laughs> Thank you very much and thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs>Thank you to those speakers, uh, and a big thank you um, to our steering committee colleague, uh, Melanie Kwan, for putting all that uh, together, for doing the interview, and then, of course, for facilitating all the recording and, and getting that on uh, so for us to see tonight. Um, so, student wellness, where to even begin? Well, a few years ago, our next presenter started doing something about it at Belmont University and did a wonderful presentation at an in-person faculty forum, if you can remember what those are like. Uh, I was inspired by uh, her presentation back then, and I've started a wellness course for all creative arts majors here at Colorado State since then, and I have our next speaker to thank for that. Uh, Dr. Alejandra Ferrer is an associate professor of music and coordinator of music therapy at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Ferrer holds a BM and MM in music therapy from the Florida State University and a PhD in music education from the Ohio State University.
Dr. Ferreira has worked in a variety of settings and is a regular presenter at regional and national music therapy conferences on topics pertaining to college student mental health, accessibility in music therapy education, and professional issues. She has authored multiple book chapters, and her work has been published in the Journal of Music Therapy, Music Therapy Perspectives, and Imagine. In the past, Dr. Ferrer served on the American Music Therapy Association's Academic and Program Approval Committee and the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. We are so pleased that Dr. Ferrer is here to enrich us on her ideas and actions around student wellness. So Alejandra, please take it away. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Knight. Thank you for such a nice introduction. That's probably the nicest number of words I've heard in a very, very long time. Um, thank you for that. And I'm so happy that you're implementing a self-care self -care class at, at your school. Um, I'll start by saying the same thing that I said last time. I am not an expert on this whatsoever. Um, I'm very interested in the topic of college student mental health and how to best support students. And that's where the idea for the class originated. Uh, our department was in crisis. This was uh, several years ago, and, and we were thinking, what do we do? What do we do? And developing a course seemed like a good first step. Um, for a while there, it was an elective class, and now it is a core music therapy course. So it is a required course for all music therapy majors. And we used to offer it once a, once a year. Now we offer it every semester so that we can keep the class size small since we do so much experiential work and we try to create a very intimate setting so that students feel comfortable um, sharing a, a variety of issues. So the first thing that I'm going to do, and Andrew, would it be possible for me to share my screen? I'm sure it is. Um, Raquel is hosting, so I'm going to get Raquel to probably hit that um, secure button for you. Okay, just let me let me know. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just provide you with some uh, data from some large scale surveys on college student mental health. And I think permission. Thank you so much. Can you can you see my PowerPoint? That's looking perfect. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'll start by let me minimize this by presenting you with some data from three different uh, surveys. And you will see that these surveys are from six months after the pandemic began, so September 2020. The following one is a year, a little bit over a year after the start of the pandemic. And then the following one is very recent. It's from January of this year. The surveys address different topics pertaining to college students. So. The first one is more of the psychosocial impact of, on the, of the pandemic on, on college students' well-being and overall health. Um, the second one is more academic challenges that, or, or the academic impacts that resulted from the pandemic. And then the third one really focused on stress and anxiety. So please ask questions, um, interrupt, share stories, uh, whatever feels good, please go, go ahead and and do it. Um, so I'm going to start with this one. This is a survey that was conducted by um, Active Minds. It's in September of 2020. And uh, around 2000 college students participated. The students that participated in all of these surveys uh, come from all over the country, both two year and four year institutions and a combination of public and private schools. So I, I think it's important to mention that it's not concentrated to either public or private. Um, I want to mention the baseline. So when, when we presented on this several years ago, before the pandemic, over one out of three students was experiencing symptoms related to mental illness. Um, over one in three students had either a formal diagnosis of depression, anxiety, or other mental health disorders, or they had symptoms that were severe enough that were impacting their daily functioning. So we didn't we our, our baseline was already pretty difficult, right, with this population. There were already lots and lots of mental health concerns among college students. When the population hit, when the pandemic hit, um, six months later, they conducted this, this survey and over 75% of the participants reported that their mental health had worsened um, over this time. 
And when they were asked, well, you know, what impact did the pandemic have on your life? The great majority of them reported, you know, stress and anxiety, uh, disappointment or sadness. A lot of them talked about the losses, not being able to um, graduate from high school, not being able to engage in those really meaningful uh, events as a freshman, for example, in college, um, not being able to meet friends or attend, um, you know, a variety of, of sorority, fraternity, uh, campus-wide social events, um, just disappointment or, or, or sadness over what, what it should have been, what it should have looked like. I, I read a number of students who said, I had been waiting my whole life to graduate from high school, or I had been waiting my whole life to um, start college and it it was nothing like like what I what I thought it would be how I had pictured it in my mind loneliness or isolation we know that during adolescence friendships and social interaction and social circles and networks are so so important um, and meaningful to just adolescent life and development and during the the lockdown this this was um, a, a problem as you can see Financial setbacks, a lot of high school students and young college students lost their jobs, so they weren't able to work. Um, many of them needed to relocate because of these financial um, issues. Some people who had started living independently all of a sudden had to move back with their parents. Um, there were roommate losses and a number of issues that caused their housing situation to, to be affected. Um, a number of young people also had COVID, so they needed to isolate, they needed to self-quarantine. As we know, many people lost a loved one to, to COVID and many people also became caregivers of those uh, with, with COVID. When asked about the top five stressors, uh, as you can see, again, that, that social component is so important. Students uh, felt very disconnected from their friends and their loved one. And this caused tremendous stress in their lives. Of course, it wasn't the only thing, but it is one that, you know, seemed to be very prevalent across the different surveys and studies that I've been looking at. Feeling disconnected, isolated, lonely, um, uncertainty regarding the unknown. So many people, uh, you know, I've, I've heard anecdotally from my own students, from colleague students, there's this fear of, what if we have to go back online? Or what if there's another lockdown? Or, you know, what if there is, um, you know, a, a, a big spread of COVID in my dorm and we're sent home or, you know, whatever, whatever could happen. Um, having difficulty focusing on school and work, perhaps this is something that you have noticed too. But what we have noticed is students having difficulty staying attentive. Um, you know, a lot of the times we see more more talking and distraction during classes than we did in the past. Turning things in in a timely manner has become a, a challenge, one that has always existed, but perhaps not to the extent that we're seeing it now. Um, and students just requiring much more extensions. And um, certainly during the time of the very active pandemic, there was a lot of grace, there was a lot of leniency, there was a lot of we're gonna try to help you out however we can. But as we've started to transition back to normalcy, it's been very, very hard for the students um, to do so as well and to meet those expectations. Finding joy while coping with the pandemic was something that was reported as well as uncertainty related to um, academics. We know that uh, students, despite all of these feelings, they found ways to cope and virtual interaction with friends was one of the most important ways that adolescents, I say adolescents, but I'm talking about high schoolers transitioning to college and then college students, freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors. Virtual interactions with friends was very, very important. And the second one, in-person interaction with friends. Sometimes I've thought about how for, for, there were a number of times where it was said, you know, it's young people are driving the pandemic, you know, young people perhaps are not as careful, as diligent, as disciplined with wearing their masks or social distancing. Um, and, and when I see these findings of, well, they were, they were interacting with their friends online, but they were also interacting with their friends in person. Sometimes I wonder, huh, is there, is there some, some correlation here? Um, being around pets, I found that to be very, very interesting. I don't know about your schools, but something that I've seen in increases is um, 
uh, therapeutic uh, emotional support um, animals, pets, companions with our students. Familial support provided at home, um, receiving virtual mental health services is something that has become uh, popular, both individual sessions as well as group sessions. These are provided through their co uh, college campuses and students are, are you know, willing to, to engage and participate. Some of them have their own mental health services through their private insurance. Involvement with campus student groups. So even though we're virtual, even though we're not on campus, we're uh, receiving our, our education remotely, we still participate in one way or another with our campus community. Some students actually benefited from the increased privacy that came from the pandemic. Um, we know that we, you know, there are introverts, there are extroverts, and perhaps not being in a busy, high social college environment was of, of benefit to, to some people. And then uh, some students actually receive financial support from the institution, uh, those who acknowledge job losses in terms of, you know, parents lost their job, the student lost their job, they received um, some financial support and that that was um, that was helpful in them coping with, with everything that was going on. And despite all of these issues, uh, college students remain very hopeful. You know, when they were asked six months after the start of the pandemic, how do you feel, you know, about the future? How do you feel about academics? How do you feel about future job prop prospects? You can see um, that, uh, you know, over 80% felt between hopeful and um, extremely hopeful. Very, very small number um, unhopeful and or not hopeful at all. Um, please, if you have any questions at, at any point, don't, don't hesitate to ask. This next study has a little bit more uh, to do with how it impacted uh, students academically. And so this one was, uh, was uh, administered by Inside Higher Ed and College Pulse. Um, you can find these in the Chronicle of Higher Ed uh, I found great links to all of these college student mental health, um, uh, some different uh, organizations. Over 2,000 uh, students participated in, in this one. And what we see in these students is the great majority of students uh, were receiving online instruction. So over 60% of the students were either taking all online courses from their house or all online courses from campus from housing. And this is important um, because we'll see how this impacted their perception of how much they learned um, and how much they got out of that academic year. Some of the students, about 33% uh, were online, but we do see that a, a over 60% were uh, receiving their education remotely, whether that was at their house or in their dorm room. And I'm more than happy to, to give you this presentation so that you can you can keep it in, in case I'm going too fast. Um, let me see this next one. When they were asked about their learning, their perceptions of learning as compared to pre-COVID years, um, you can see that over half of them said, a little over half, I learned less this year than in pre-COVID years. About 25% said, I learned about the same. 20% um, though felt that, you know, they learned they had learned more than pre COVID years. And again, you never know. It's like the student who really benefited from going home and perhaps being on their own and not having to deal with as, as uh, you know, peers and social pressures and social interactions. Maybe there are those learners who do really, really well with asynchronous uh, courses or with even, you know, synchronous courses, but learning through through an online means. Amount of time spent on courses. Uh, close to half of the students said it, it would take me longer to um, complete courses as compared to pre-COVID year, years. And, and I think that goes back to um, inability to focus, uh, challenges with, you know, perhaps they're at home, so there are greater disruptions, older siblings, parents, grandparents, pets. Um, there's a lot going on. And so it took them a little bit longer than, than in the past to complete homework assignments. It, a lot of um, the, the studies that I looked at, students reported it just wasn't motivating to receive uh, my, my, my classes online. You know, I, I wasn't as engaged, I wasn't as excited to learn. And because of that, you know, it's, it slowed me down. 
This is a, an, an interesting one for us. So when students were asked, how, how did you feel about your professors and the degree of support that they provided you, the degree of leniency and grace? And as you can see, 60% um, of, of students said, my professors were flexible, my professors were accommodating. And, you know, sometimes you wonder, we, we needed to be flexible, we needed to be accommodating and supportive. Did this have an impact on academic integrity? Did this have an impact on their development of clinical skills? Are, are, we going, are we seeing those results now? Will we see them three years, four years from now when they begin to enter their internships? Um, what are those losses? What are the learning gaps? Did we implement mitigation strategies? So we can be lenient, we can be supportive, but the, does that backfire at some point is, is something to, to think about. And I'm sure we all have. Um, this one, it, it's interesting, about 20%, my professors were inflexible about deadlines um, if I needed more time to complete an assignment. Regarding feeling prepared for the following year. So um, the, the students whose uh, school shut down in the spring of 2020, and six months later, you know, they were asked, how did you feel about starting this academic year? Whether you were a returning college student or you were entering college for the first time. And a good number of them felt either very unprepared or somewhat unprepared. Um, you see that it's, it's over 50%. Very small number felt uh, very prepared. Some, it didn't impact how they felt about returning to school. And then, uh, another important one is what was helpful to you as a student uh, during that first year of online education and um, online discussion or chat boards is something that was mentioned. Uh, having reminders or nudges from professors was also uh, considered very helpful. Academic advising, tutoring, um, career services through through colleges. I, I remember during those that first year sending lots of students to the writing center, the math center. Um, we have a, an office called the GPS office where they teach the students study skills and organization skills. And it seemed more than ever we were sending students um, to these these offices. Chat bots, bots was another one that um, that was a uh, very popular. And if in case you don't know what a chat box is, chatbot is, I'm sure you've interacted with one at one point or another where it's the live chat. You visit a web page and you know there's there's someone there that's ready to chat with you. Um, it's an automatic automated response, lots of preloaded questions and generic answers. So students found that to be helpful as well. And then uh, follow uh, concerns uh, pertaining to the following academic year. So this fall that just started, students were asked, what, what are your concerns? And many of them said, you know, I, I'm not sure about my level of motivation. They had been online now for part of the spring of 2020, all of fall and all of spring, because this uh, survey was administered in May of 2021. So when they were asked about fall, one of their biggest worries was not feeling motivated. Again, we hear about difficulty concentrating, struggling with my mental health, feeling behind academically. We've seen it clinically. Um, maybe you have colleagues in theory and oral skills, but I've heard the oral skills teacher, teachers talk lots and lots and lots about the losses and how teaching oral skills, um, you know, online just really resulted in, in lots of learning loss and, and struggles. And um, the same thing for secondary piano. Uh, perhaps even secondary guitar, those of us who, who taught guitar online. And then the last survey that I wanted to present to you was the one that was just published um, in January. And this one talks about, you know, psychosocial issues, specifically uh, issues with anxiety and depression. So Students were asked, do you think there is a mental health crisis on college campuses in the US? And wow, what a high number said, yes, our campuses are in crisis. So we as faculty have seen this increase in, in mental health needs. Um, I think it's interesting to that students are so insightful and so aware that they themselves or their peers um, are struggling. 
some of the absences that we have had this semester have, have resulted from students taking care of their friends, of their peers, of their um, roommates who are experiencing uh, significant mental health needs. So they're going through it and their friends are going through it. Are you experiencing emotional distress or stress? Um, because of these new variants, think about it, this is January of 2022. So students have already been living with the pandemic for close to two years. And um, the, the variants, COVID continues to cause stress and anxiety. In fact, um, what the, the study, some of the studies that I've looked at, they reported that students are now more anxious and more stressed about the pandemic than they were early on. And um, about half of them say they're much more um, scared about actually being diagnosed with COVID than they were a year or two ago. What about the pandemic causes you stress or anxiety? I was surprised um, to, to see that so many students were so concerned with the impact of the pandemic on the quality of their education. I don't know why I was surprised, but I, I'm just being honest. Impact on my social life, for sure. We've seen um, how much that, that comes up. Physical separation or isolation from friends, um, impact on physical health, impact on family, impact on ability to work, finances, um, and enjoying everything that campus normally has to offer. Talking to freshmen, talking to sophomores, they'll say, you know, I didn't have the, the traditional freshman experience. I didn't go to any of the events. I was, you know, really not even able to sometimes interact with people on other floors. Um, in the cafeteria, students had to go eat at staggered times. In the hallways, the schedules were arranged, for example, so that students were not all communing at the same time in the hallways or outside, but rather smaller groups of students. Uh, what methods do you intend to use this academic year to cope with stress and or anxiety? So we're talking about spring of 2021 and perhaps looking into fall of, I'm sorry, spring of 2022 and perhaps looking into fall of 2022. Spending time with friends, um, whether that's in person or through videos or FaceTime, exercising, playing video games, watching TV or movies, mindfulness, engaging in mindfulness exercises, um, about 20% said virtual mental health counseling, whether it's telehealth, teletherapy, but definitely accessing those services. This one was, was an interesting one, disconnecting from social media and news. I think students are beginning to realize, you know, the negative effects that, you know, sustained engagement with social media is having on their mental health. Um, and then there were some people who said, you know, they rely on, on their religious beliefs or in person mental health counseling, but that's a that's a pretty small number uh, right there, uh, those who, who are accessing um, in-person mental health services. And I say it's a small number compared to the observed need and, and what the stats are, are telling us. Uh, do you intend to seek out any type of, um, any kind of emotional support to manage stress or anxiety? And, you know, a good number said yes. So students acknowledge that you know, it's difficult to do this alone and that they need to rely on their teachers, on their family members, on their friends, or, you know, on a counselor, um, a psychiatrist, a doctor. And then this is um, the last uh, question pertaining to the survey. How would you prefer your institution to support you uh, through the pandemic this year? And about half of the students would like to see more uh, remote health and well-being support, uh, whether it's through telehealth or just um, in-person mental health services. For those students who did not return to campus, something available remotely would be helpful. More remote social support, sense of belonging, again, those feelings of isolation, more virtual academic support. Uh, I, I, that's, you know, I, that is not something that we've provided, of course, office hours. Um, We've recorded our lectures, we've uploaded them, we've done everything that we can, but I'm, I'm just wondering what, what exactly do, do they mean? And I was not able to find that information or um, none of the above. I, I feel pretty satisfied with how my university or college is um, handling 
the pandemic. So before moving on, I would love to um, just hear a little bit of, of your thoughts uh, and experiences that, that you've had over the last couple of years and you know, mitigation strategies, compensation strategies, how have you, how have you dealt with this? Um, what has it been like for you and at your school? So if, if anybody would like to share, if not, I'm, I'm happy to continue. Hi, Alejandra. Hi, Susie. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Good. Uh, I'm so glad you brought up um, the very interesting thing that's happened with our flexible deadlines um, that, the, that the study showed, and, and you talked about it too. We were so flexible that somehow the students now are really struggling to meet deadlines and um and i'm not you know we don't want the pendulum to completely swing back to you know we want to accept that they that lives are different now but i'm really I, I do think now as they're moving into clinical work that they're they're not passing certain professional dispositions because they haven't been able to meet deadlines or haven't been responsible in some professional ways that we see as benchmarks for them proceeding to go into clinical work like are they going to show up at their site and some of them haven't shown up at their sites on time for their first field works and it's impacted their internships it, it's it's not everybody of course but i i'd love to hear what you have to say about that and i'm not really sure what to do about it because um it's i, I do feel like um we haven't provided some basic foundational things that we've always thought are like the stepping stones to a person becoming a professional. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thoughts? That's a, that's a really, really good point, Susie. How do we transition them back? Um, and especially those who came, you know, came in to college during the pandemic, they perhaps have never experienced college level expectations. So now all of a sudden, two years later, we're trying um, really, really hard and there's resistance. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the recommendations that has come out of these different surveys that I, I have that as one of the last slides, um, two pages of recommendations that I found. One of them is helping students transition back to pre-pandemic times and um, expectations and just ways of doing things. But I, I don't know. I don't know because I'm struggling with it myself. And I'll tell you, I'm seeing it with grad students. And, and I know that my colleagues are seeing it with undergrads. It's not just undergrads, it's grads too. Yeah. Um, so, and so developmentally too, ages don't even, you know, chronological ages. Although these are definitely still early 20s type people. Yeah. So thank you. I got some. Thank you, Alejandra. This has been really um, helpful, all this information that you've provided for us so far. Um, <clears throat> yes, the transition back has been difficult. And what I found was like I was starting to set more boundaries and then other people weren't. So as a department, we came together and we said, OK, for this, they can have an extra two days for this, whatever they have to, they can't just have like open the barn doors and let the, the horses run out. And so we together decided so that we were a united front because they would say, Dr. Vega, blah, blah, blah. But Dr. So-and-so let me, you know, turn in everything the week of finals. And, and I also um, tried to reiterate several times throughout, it's not about just turning in assignments. It's about stacking the learning and making that progress. Um, because uh, like a lot of them just think, oh, okay, I can just dump all of it at the end and that's it. And that's not it. And I don't accept after seven days, it's a, it's a flat zero. Um, if you have a mental health crisis, if you had somebody in your family die or whatever, I, I'll give some flexibility, but I'm not going to continue. And everybody was a united front and that ha happened. And I think I'm lucky because my grad students are a little bit older. So I was only seeing this in the undergrad class that I was teaching. And it was juniors and mostly seniors. Um, and I was surprised because they weren't always affected by COVID, you know? 
and they still were doing this. Um, grad students, I have not had that, but my grad students are um, old, older, 30s, 40s. Um, I have one a little bit older. So I think that they're used to the work-life balance um, and they do better. So I think it is a developmental thing. So I'll, I'll yeah. zip it. <laughs> no, that, that makes perfect sense. You know, I haven't seen it so much in the juniors and the seniors. The seniors are very motivated. They've got their internships. You know, they're, they're ready to, to go and, and they're excited. The juniors are sort of right in the middle, but I have seen a lot of difficulty with the current freshman class as well as the, the sophomore class. Um, yeah. Any, any other, other comments? Yeah. What, uh, how have you compensated for some of the gaps or losses that may have resulted from students having one or two or three entire semesters on telehealth. I went to regional conference a couple of weeks ago and I was talking to an internship director who said, this is the first time that my intern has ever worked with live, a live group. All four of their practica were online. They were all through telehealth. And he said, there's there are there are just so many challenges that I had never experienced um, as a as a supervisor. So mitigation strategies, how did you how did you compensate? Does anybody have have anything they'd like to share? Honestly, Alondra, I think we're all still. I think I'm. I'll speak for myself still yeah. figuring that out yeah um, and we're just seeing the holes and we're seeing how they're not prepared in certain ways and um i think there's going to be a certain amount of time like it could be three to five years for the equilibrium for things to get back a little bit because um uh the internship supervisors are going to have to kind of cover a little bit for us and because we have to graduate them in a way we have to move them forward everybody has a different system i know but mm -hmm. uh and there's an there is an acknowledgement from the internship supervisors that they're not as prepared, you know, if at all. Mm -hmm. But so I, I don't know, um, how, like, I, I think it's just going to work itself out a little bit in the next, this whole cycle of sophomore, you know, freshmen, sophomores, et cetera, are going to kind of hopefully they're going to get stronger. And in a way, if there's a silver lining, they are also going to have training in telehealth. So they're going to have this kind of yeah e certified certification that I didn't have, you know. So um, I think in some ways they may be stronger for it, um, but probably the juniors, juniors and seniors now more because they had a little bit of both. Um, but the freshmen and sophomores are still, you know, it's going to. I think it's just going to take a cycle or two. I don't really know what to mm -hmm. do about it, but I'm open to any ideas. Jess, were you going to say something? Thank you, Susie. I just saw your, your microphone coming on or off, maybe not. Well, I'm, I'm gonna, unless there are other comments, I'm gonna continue just to make sure that, that we get through, through the presentation. But again, please feel free to, um, to share at any point. Uh, so as, as Andrew mentioned, we have been, uh, doing this self-care class for several years now. Um, not, not several, the program is just several years old, um, but maybe uh, four or five years. And initially it was a once a year and now it's an every semester um, uh, required music therapy course. And uh, we, you know, we've infused the, um, the practice of self-care and wellness um, and healthy living into all of our classes. And we, we would do this from the very beginning. Now more so it's, it's something that we really, really talk about that we really stress and that we try as much as we can to model uh, for our students. So to tell you a little bit about the course um, and I'm happy to share syllabus. I'm happy to share the presentation that we did a couple of years back where we talked about the class in depth. Um, but to tell you a little bit about it, the purpose of the course is to 
bring awareness to the importance of self-care and wellness practices, and to teach students how to engage in taking good care of oneself from a holistic perspective um, in order to help promote a balanced and healthy life, overall greater well-being, professional satisfaction, and career longevity. So one of the things that we talk often is um, you know, people, people leaving the field uh, because of issues with burnout, uh, compassion fatigue, you know, problems with, um, you know, we, we face so many professional issues as music therapists, we really need to build thick skin, we, we need to be aware of what we're going to encounter, we need to be resilient. And so the class addresses a, a lot of these issues as well. Um, and when we talk about a holistic point of view, we're really addressing all domains of wellness, you know, social wellness, emotional wellness, physical wellness, financial and spiritual wellness. So we, we look at all of the different domains and we, we talk about well, what, what can we improve? Um, is there one particular area that I'm not paying attention to? And this is something, this discussion, uh, you know, really does carry us through the entire semester. This is the textbook that we use. It is wonderful. It is a workbook and it is designed, of course, for professional music therapists. There's a lot that um, that I have had to adapt or that simply is. Oh, you just hold on one second. You disappeared. There you are. Oh, my goodness. It's we still we still are no not very good at this. Um, but this is a, a great, great, great textbook. I love it. I've read it a number of times. Ami Kunimura, Music Therapist, um, Resilience Over Burnout, a self-care guide for music therapist. Like I said, it's a workbook. It has lots of exercises, many of them um, to you know, help increase self-awareness. And it really just breaks down the idea of physical uh, and emotional and creative self-care. It has lots of templates for um, different uh, self-care self plans. It has some assessment tools. So I, it's a great one um, and I, I recommend it. It's also uh, very inexpensive. It's an ebook, so it's $25. Now, if you want to obtain CMTE and, and do the actual course and engage in the exercises, then it costs more. But for, for the students, it is, it is a, a good price as compared to many other textbooks. And this is something that they'll be able to hopefully keep and use for, for the rest of, of their careers. Uh, these are some of the topics that we cover. We talk about the various self-care and wellness domains. We talk about what we think is self-care, but it truly, truly isn't. We talk about barriers to self-care, uh, professional fatigue syndromes. Um, Ami Kunimura does a beautiful job outlining these. We talk about values, how our value systems can affect our self-care practice, um, boundaries and healthy supports. We talk a lot about distortions and uh, cognitive distortions and cognitive reframing. We talk about mindfulness and stress management. We do lots of relaxation exercises and um, a, a good number of what we do, a good uh, number of the assignments that we do are reflective in nature in order to help promote that self-awareness. Self we do uh, experientials every, every class period. Um, in fact, for the first half of the semester, we really looked at the textbook closely and we did lots of discussions and written reflexive, um, uh, reflective assignments. Now we've moved to discussions and uh, experiential. So we do a daily gratitude practice. Everybody you know, uh, reflects a little bit on, on something that they're grateful for that day and they can share it. We do this writing and then they can also share it with their peers. Um, we've created vision boards. Uh, we've done, you know, relaxation exercises. We've written positive affirmations in the forms of cards that they can keep um, on themselves. You know, we've also written, uh, we call them the coping cards. So if I'm feeling anxious, this is what I plan on doing. And I have that in my wallet. If I have a panic attack, this is what I'm going to do. If I have, um, you know, issues with anger management and I have an anger outburst, this is what I'm going to do. So we're trying to do whatever we can to promote wellness and to, equip students with tools to deal with all of all of these issues that you know have been manifesting now for for several years and and have have gotten worse as a result of the pandemic we do lots of creative writing creative storytelling writing letters to themselves uh writing letters to others uh, developing playlists lots of show and tell uh meditation exercises 
Show and tell can be very simple. For example, in the beginning of the semester, their, one of their homework assignments was to go to um, Michael's Hobby Lobby, Joanne's Arts and Crafts, uh, the, the, the Arts and Crafts hobby section of a store and pick something new to try. So we started very, very um, easily or very easy, very, um, very simple ways of incorporating self-care practices, um, even though when you really define self-care and you really study self-care, you, you see that that's more of a pseudo self-care, but that's, that's where we started. And it was fun for them to say, you know, I went to Michael's Arts and Crafts and this is what I bought and this is what I'm going to be doing um, for the next uh, several weeks. And just this week, they presented those projects that they had started at the beginning of the semester. Uh, other homework assignments, of course, the readings, they've all made coping boxes with items that are uh, helpful to them. They, of course, have shared these with the class, developing new hobbies and practices, uh, engaging in gratitude and mindfulness exercises outside of the classroom that they need to reflect on. And then they had the major project was a self-care project. And, you know, we, we, were, we talked about SMART goals. And so we wrote, they wrote their own self-care goals and um, smart goal format. Uh, we created ways to, to track their uh, positive changes in behavior. So they, they kept data. Um, we, they selected ways that they would uh, reinforce or praise their progress. Um, and there were some reflective assignments uh, throughout, the, throughout the semester. Any, any questions on on this class, on, on anything pertaining to, to the class. Students have really enjoyed it. They say it's their favorite class. Yeah, because they get to do lots of nice, fun things, um, but it's also very helpful and, and hopefully very meaningful and something that will, will help them in all aspects of their life. Um, Andrew and, and Vicky? Sure, how do, how, uh, how do you actually go about um, kind of doing any sort of assessments or grading like is it just kind of like uh, you know if they they do something it's like they're putting the effort out into it and you're not really going to critique the specificity of the self-care aspect of the of the project or um you know how do we because because i want it to be yeah. i want my version of it to be i don't know what to say fun carefree whatever i want it to be experiential and something that's valuable to them honestly and i don't really want to treat it as course based as you know the uh, the system the systemic you know university wants it to be this is so tricky that's such a good question and i'm still figuring it out um you know a great portion of the grade is based on attendance and participation so i stress that very much you have to come to class it's so valuable what we talk about and what we practice in the class um it's important that you participate it can't be that you know half of the the, the classes so engaged and, and so genuine and authentic and sharing and open. And then we have a group of, of very quiet students who are, again, resistant to that, that sort of group process that takes place during every class period. We, I have had many opportunities where people have not turned in their assignments and I offer the leniency. It's hard, right? We want this to be intrinsic. We want them to want to do this. Um, I think the majority have, have never uh, taken advantage or, or, or not met expectations, but of course there have been those situations and I'm still working on how do I do this? How do I grade this? You know, that self-care project is so important and that's, that's a big part of, of the grade. So I, I ex there are expectations on how they should have documented um, their progress, how they should have written their goals, um, how many times a week, a minimal number of times that they needed to reflect on on how things were going. So, but I, I'm with you, it's hard. Um, Vicki and then Susie. Um, I got a comment and then I have a question. Um, I taught a class for a while uh, across the university called Expressing Yourself Through the Arts. And so I did art movement and, and music and I actually did poetry as well. And um, so it was experiential like this where they were exper uh, experimenting with different modes of being and they had to do a journal. And so they had to have, like you said, the criteria was so many entries, so many like, 
pieces yeah. of art where they uh, did a, a scribble thing or they had like a a ticket from I don't know Jazz Fest or whatever in yes. there. So that that was one of. But the other thing I did was I had them like if we were doing something on mindfulness, they had to find an article in a peer review journal and it could be like the arts of psychotherapy that kind of address that so that they can talk about um maybe other ideas of how to be mindful um that so whatever the topic was i had them find an article and that article was was a, a good way to do you know do some academic rigor but still have fun and then get them thinking a little out of the box and their special project was they came up with their own class of okay this is the experiential this is what we're doing and what is the article that you would like your your students to read and why so um my question was how many um credits is this and is it taught like the freshman year you know that kind of thing um, it is. I, I love everything that you did, by the way, in, in your class and, and the special project. Um, it is a one credit hour class and it meets uh, twice a week for 50 minutes. So Tuesday, Thursdays, uh, 11 to 1150. And then you asked one more thing. Um, um, oh, when when do they take it? So we had to figure that out. Right. We know how packed music therapy students semesters are. Right now it is, um, we, they take it as freshmen and we chose it then because we were seeing so many problems with, um, with mental health that we thought the earlier, the better, the earlier that we can help them gain insight, you know, be truly self-aware and develop coping skills. So, so they, they take it um, as freshmen, second, se second semester generally, but first semester, you know, it's, it's available. So, yeah, we, we still have some older students in the classes because it did not become a requirement until last academic year. And, and like you said, you know, we have them, for example, over the weekend, their homework assignment uh, early on in the semester, this was uh, probably around the first or second week, it was to create the coping box. So how do you create a coping box, right? But they had to bring it in that Tuesday and they had to show it and it needed to have a specific number of items, a minimal number of items. Um, the same thing with the hobby, uh, write-ups, songwriting activities, for example, or when they write their own relaxation scripts, they bring it in and, you know, we, we do some, some sharing, those who feel comfortable. Um, Susie? So I love a lot of these ideas and, and um, the whole way you've designed the course. It sounds really fascinating. My mm -hmm. question and, and somewhat of a concern is, is this a therapy group? Um, <laughs> you're in the line of therapy and education. Yes. And you, are, you do have requirements. And some students um, aren't ready uh, to go to therapy. Now we want them to, they're gonna be therapists. We'd like them to be more open, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this is a required, it sounds like a required course for them to be, to open up in a group setting that, in which they're being evaluated. Um, and, uh, and you are monitoring in a way their mental health. Um, you're getting insight into who they are and what's yeah. going on. And you know, because you're a trained clinician, um, what some warning signs would be. And that could be maybe very protective for them so that you can see that. On the other hand, we're then in a position um, as mandated reporters, um, uh, you know, and I'm a little, con like I'm, I was right on the bandwagon. And then I was like, oh no, wait a second. This could be tricky yes. um, if it's required. And, um, and some students may be ready for it in their junior year, but are not ready for it in their freshman year as yes. much as we'd like them to be. But it would be perfect for them when they're 21, you know, but not when they're 18, you know. Yes. And um, and that's OK, because everybody's in a di different developmental place. So I just want your thoughts on that if you have a minute. My gosh. Well, this is hard. You're, you're absolutely right about everything. Um, I will tell you something that. I hope it's not misinterpreted. In Introduction to Music Therapy, all the freshmen take it their first semester. The last page of my syllabus is a whole write-up on 
inappropriate self-disclosure on this is not the major for you to figure out your own mental health issues and vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, while we acknowledge that some of the content could be triggering to you, uh, we need to be careful. We, we have to expose you to certain things. We need to share certain um, clinical scenarios that we've encountered, difficult situations. Um, and and we, we know what that can do to students and what, what can happen to the classroom, right? The oversharing, the, you know, crossing lots of, of different boundaries. Um, so they, they hear that speech of, of this is uh, in the introduction to music therapy class, which is very different, right? Um, the approach is very different. It's a lecture-based course and, and, and nothing like, like the self-care class. You know, I don't know, Susie, we have not had anything, anything negative happen yet. <laughs> yet. We've had lots of other negative things happen outside of this class. Lots of breakdowns, suicidal ideation, suicidal attempts, inappropriate um, sharing, students getting involved with each other in, in ways that are very problematic. So far, the classes have been very soothing, very calming, very lighthearted, uh, but it just takes one to get a domino effect going. So I, I hear you. Andrew, you look like you might want to say something. Oh, nope, I'm just, I'm going through the exact same, <laughs> same questions in my head yeah. that everyone's getting on my course too, because I, I set it up so similar to yours. I'm like, it's one credit and it's, it was elective. It still is elective and everything. I'm like, oh, right. Should it be required? Oh, wait a minute. I don't know. And then all the things you're saying about lightheartedness and everything. So I'm just, I'm, yeah. I'm right in with you. Um, you know, when we talk about sensitive issues, for example, we'll talk about, um, you know, symptoms of depression and anxiety. We, um, we always follow up with conversations about coping skills. We always follow up with conversations about resources uh, within the school, within the community. We talk to them from intro to music therapy, as well as in this class, the importance of pursuing your own therapy. Now, we know that they're not all ready, but we try really hard to normalize it, to normalize going to therapy, um, to normalize that we are all struggling in so many different ways. Um, and the, the main point of the class, the, the core of the class is self-care is learning what is self-care? How do you practice self-care? What's getting in the way of your self-care practice? Um, and it's about gaining insight and self-awareness into perhaps things that you do that are not conducive to good health, mental health and physical health. So those, those more intimate challenging conversations don't happen perhaps as, as frequently as you would think. And, and, you know, when we do exercises, uh, relaxation exercises, um, improvisation exercises, whether it's vocally or instrumentally, again, very lighthearted. Um, we talk often about we can't open the can of worms that we can't close within a 50 minute class. And so, you know, you, you sort of set things up, but any moment it can explode. <laughs> um, other, other questions or other comments? We talk a lot about happiness. We talk a lot about um, state anxiety versus trait anxieties. They, they take some assessments. They enjoy taking those, those assessments. They take strengths finders, the Enneagram. Um, they, they love sort of that process of formal self-discovery or guided self-discovery. Uh, something interesting that I, I wanted to ask because it's, it's happened to me so many times. Um, students not coming to class saying, I took a self-care day. I took a mental health day. I am prioritizing my self-care. They have said that to me. I am prioritizing my self-care, which is why I'm not coming to class. So perhaps it's happened to you too. But anyway, I know it's time. So the last slide that I wanted to, to show you, it's just some of the recommendations that have come from all of these different uh, 
large scale surveys and, and some smaller scale studies that I looked at. And these are recommendations for schools and educators. We want to equip students with, with tools to increase their wellness, their resiliency. We want them to, to take responsibility of, over their health and their well being. So these are some of the recommendations. Of course, improving access to mental health service, services and treatment, um, alleviating the academic distress. We did that for a while. We have to be careful about how we continue doing this. Um, helping to compensate for social experiences, educational experiences, opportunities, developmental milestones that students missed because of the pandemic. Facilitating transition back to pre-COVID routines. We're still trying to figure out how do you do this? Um, attending to, various, uh, to areas of basic needs, including food and housing insecurities. We see that even at Belmont, it's a private schools school. A lot of the students, the great majority of the students um, come from, from some very you know, well off um, socioeconomic status, but there are still those who um, you know, do not have food sometimes over the weekend that I've actually ha had, they, they've said you know, exactly that. I don't have food because I give it all to my mom or to my grandma. These students got lost during the pandemic. We didn't see them. They weren't in front of us and express their needs as easily, but now they're back on campus so we can keep a, a, a close eye on them. Continue to promote telehealth, continue to promote the use of um, the counseling centers at school, include well-being practices into coursework, also support the faculty and the staff, um, maintaining good budgets for mental health services and staffing, including student voices on any type of COVID-19 task force, uh, developing comprehensive communication plans. You know, why is a student missing this class? How are they doing in your class? Is there congruency among uh, the, the different teachers of, of what may be happening with the student. Adapt and develop innovative health services and, and you, can, you can look at the um, support programming developed by students. So re-motivating students, helping students refocus and, and of, of what it means to be a college student. Promoting social connectivity, establishing routines and normalcy. But then also being proactive for you know, what, what may happen in the future and hopefully we are much more prepared this time around and, and it's not as, as difficult. So those are some of the recommendations that I, that I have found. Um, but any, any final questions, any last thoughts? Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alejandra. Um, thank you. I, I'm a little concerned because uh, it is uh, it's April 20th. It's 4:20 in Colorado. For anybody who's actually putting those two bits of information together about what that means for Colorado, and there's a fraternity right across my office that is absolutely partying very loudly right now. So I apologize if that's coming across in the microphone. It's been the soundtrack for the last 30 minutes for me right now, um, and I, I wonder if they're thinking that they're doing their own self care. I suppose. Um, or doing their own student wellness, right? Um, I, I am sure this is another really important point in the ongoing conversation on on this really important topic for educators and supervisors. Uh, thanks to all our speakers tonight for your time and energy in facilitating all of the informative moments tonight. Um, we've asked everyone uh, attending or watching the, the this YouTube uh, video later to take a short survey at the end of each faculty forum event. And so that link will go in the chat. It'll also be posted on the Music Therapy Faculty Facebook page and the Supervisor Facebook page. And it'll come to you in a follow up email uh, if you're on the faculty um, email listserv. Please click on that link to help us inform the educator gatherings in the future by taking that, that link. It'll just be five minutes or less just to take that survey. Uh, again, uh, please consider uh, nominating music therapy educators or yourself to serve on the 2022 to 2024 faculty steering committee. You can contact me or Vicki with any questions or nominations. Uh, and a reminder, a call for nominations will again be going out and nominations have been extended to June 1st. And thanks to all of you for joining us. 
uh, on behalf of the rest of the steering committee, we thank all of you for attending and taking an active role tonight. This video will be posted on our YouTube site as well. The link will be in the email, but you can always go to YouTube and just search Music Therapy Faculty Forum, and then our homepage will come up with all of our links and all the videos uh, that Raquel has been graciously recording and then posting on the YouTube channel. If you have any more questions or comments, please email us at musictherapyfaculty at gmail.com. Again, it's musictherapyfaculty, all one word, at gmail.com. And that's all we have for you tonight. Thank you and good night.